I have two gentlemen in studio with me this afternoon. We'll be taking a look at some pictures. We have men and women on the ground as well who will be letting us know what has happened since the actual spillage took place, where we are, what the VRA is saying, that's the Volta River Authority, who manned the dam, who are responsible for the dam that was spilled. We're told that the dam was spilled the last time in 2010, 13 years ago. And for some reason, that has had to be done again in 2023. Uh, this morning, the reports are telling us that over 6,000 individuals have been victimized by this spillage. People have been displaced. They've lost property. We're not really sure how many lives have been lost, if any. Look, so many things, so much devastation, and we're here to talk about it. I also have you know that City FM and City TV, we are taking a stance, we're taking action, and we're encouraging you, our viewers and our listeners, to support our cause in gathering relief items and relief support for the people who've been affected across the several districts and communities that, uh, you know, have had to experience this terrible thing. The flyer is on the screen. We'll, we'll put it up shortly. Uh, we are asking for items such as water, sachet and bottled. We're asking for food, canned, bagged. We're asking for mattresses, blankets, toiletries and detergent, medical supplies. It really is a serious situation. And I do hope that as you listen to the conversations here, you see how far we've come over the last few days. Where this issue is concerned, you understand that it is no joke that we're dealing with. There we have it, the fly on the screen for our relief support campaign. There is a mobile money number. Um, it's 0550 The name on the account is Omnimedia. It is an MTN Momo number. Um, and if you have further inquiries, perhaps you need to ask some questions, you're not too sure what to do, then you can call 0205-973-973, 0205-973-973. That is the hotline. Now, let me introduce my guest. I have in studio here with me this afternoon, Bernard Avle. He is the host of the City Breakfast Show on 97.3 City FM. We also have Charles Osukumi, who is a reporter, and he has been on the ground. He's seen it all. Um, he's traumatized by it, I can imagine. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we've been seeing pictures. Some of us haven't gone to the localities yet, yeah. but uh, I, I can imagine what it has been like, Charles. So I'll start with you. What did you see? How were you feeling? And really, why is it so important that we should be concerned as a nation about this? I mean, at Pioko, it's, you know, as reporters, we are told not to, I mean, immerse ourselves into our stories, but it's very difficult to do that story without, you know, being, you know, professional about it. It's, it's one of the most devastating things I've seen in a very long time. I mean, we saw pictures on social media before we went to Mefe on Thursday, and we saw pictures. I mean, it looked quite bad until we got there. I mean, people's lives completely changed overnight for them. Um, we saw people living on their roof. Uh, that was quite interesting for me. I asked, I asked this gentleman why he's there on the roof. He says he has nowhere to go. I mean, he doesn't have um, family around or friends around to go and live with. So he and his family, they have set up camp on this roof and they, they cook there, they, they get shelter from there. It's, it's very devastating. I mean, you see the let water levels had, you know, um, come all the way from the banks of the, of the river into about 20 to 300, 200 to 300 meters into the communities and houses, homes, um, story buildings. I mean, you could see first floors of the story buildings all completely inundated by, by the river. I mean, some of the people we spoke to told us to bring them water because the water had become so contaminated it wasn't they couldn't use it for anything and they some people some of them drink from this this river they use the river for almost everything cooking washing and the water had become so contaminated that they were unable to use it again so that was one of the most important things they asked for which was which was water and um, so from Mepe we moved to Mepe is in the North Tong um, district, district, so we moved to Central okay, Tong. So Charles, before you go on, so from what we understand, Mepe 
is the community that's been most affected yes. by this spillage so far, uh, as, as far as we know. Yes, um, I mean, so we're told about 25% of Mepe is completely underwater currently. And can you imagine, like, the whole 25% of the whole community under, underwater? Do we know how big this community is? How many people live there? What's their livelihood? Like, are they farmers? Are they fisher folk? So most of them are, are, are fishermen and, they are close and, to the fish, water. and fish farmers because they're very close to the water. And uh, some of them are also um, farmers, they're crop farmers. But they are unable to go and on with these fa fish farming activities because their ponds that they have you know, constructed on their, on their river have all been washed away. Mm -hmm. And they can't even access their homes. I mean... So they've all been completely cut off away from their daily lives, which is their homes. And so they've had to some move upfield and move to other villages and settle with other people. We actually met this woman who was, she was actually packing her things. And she said, I asked her, she said she was moving to the next village. I asked her, do you know people there? She said, oh no, but because we are all Avers, if I go there, I may get someone to go and live with in, in the interim. So it's very difficult for the people of Mepe especially. We have some images on the screen. Like I said, we do have the men and the women on the ground. These are some drone images. This is a general area that you're looking at. You can almost see the, the you know, physical map having been drawn on the screen. The Volta Lake is in there. And imagine everything around there. Some of that water that you're seeing is actually covering yeah. land, homes, schools, places where people would usually be engaged on their day-to-day -day life, day-to-day -day activity. And that's what you're seeing on the a screen at the moment. The school we saw at Mepe had been temporarily closed down to be used as um, a safe haven for people who had been displaced. So we met people there, living there. They were actually cooking um, when we went there on Thursday morning. It was, it was a makeshift um, safe haven for them to live there um, in the interim. Okay, wonderful. Bernard, let, let me come to you. Now, you have spoken extensively to the VRA. I mean, this morning on the City Breakfast Show, you were knee-deep, you know, dealing with them, asking a lot of questions. Many things were said. What do we know at the moment from the standpoint of the VRA? Wow, this is... Thank you, Apioko, <laughs> and thank you, Charles, for your work. We want to commend uh, uh, Fred Duho, yeah. Umaru Sanda, and the team of cameramen and women there and all those who are working hard to bring relief to people. The Volta Lake is the world's third largest man-made lake by volume. All right? And it has about 148 cubic kilometers of water. So that's a lot of water. Um, the situation in the Volta Lake is that it is affected by the water that flows from as far as Mali. So it's the black water, the white water. So northern Togo, Burkina Faso, Mali, parts of every coast, mm -hmm. all coming in. So if you, if you, the, the black water starts from Burkina, uh, uh, from, from um, Côte d'Ivoire mm -hmm. and meanders its way and comes down into the, the Volta Lake through the BA area. Then you have the white water that starts partly from Burkina Faso. Then you have the Oti River that also joins and rivers like the Afram also join. Mm -hmm. Now, my understanding is that there's been a lot of water from northern Ghana, a lot of rain, lots of water from Burkina Faso that's coming in, particularly northern Togo as well. Not even spillage of any dam, which has just happened to have happened at the same time. Mm. We need so, to this, be, so this is just normal rain. Yes. Now, what VRA yeah. says to me is that in May this year, they did a simulation because they knew this was going to happen. Okay. So they did a simulation exercise with NADMO and other agencies to simulate this scenario, which is why... All the shelters you went to, people knew of the shelters before they went. So it wasn't as if they woke up one day and just saw water and they had to run away. Because of the simulations done in May and because they started spilling in 15, on 15 September, they kind of knew that there was going to be an issue. But of course, nobody could guess the level of, of devastation. So, so we need to put that out there. Now, the VRA have said to us that the maximum operating level for the Volta Lake or the dam yeah, so if you, look at the, if you look at the map on the screen, the, this map shows you the tributaries of, or, or the sources of the, 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 the Volta Lake. So Oti comes in from Togo side, White Volta from Burkina Faso, and there's even another one all the way from Mali. 
if you look on all the way up there. So the basin is what we've put in the in the shaded line. Okay. All right. Now, so all these water bodies are emptying into the the lake, which we've just dumped at at Impoku. At, at the base. At the base <laughs> at Impoku. So prior to this, it was just a simple river. So once you dam it, all this water is blocked by a very small gorge. So there's over 1.5 billion cubic feet of water that you are retaining, mm. which is very powerful. Now, the Akosombo Dam has um, 12 valves. These valves have been put there to allow you to release water. <laughs> Those are the valves. Okay. So nice. what you see is one, two, three, four valves mm -hmm. that have opened on the screen. They have 12 of these valves, all right? Now, as of Saturday, they had opened eight of these 12. Releasing 183,000 cubic feet of water per second. It's a lot. 183 cubic feet of water per second. Now, according to the um, deputy CEO of VRA engineer, Edward Obin Kenzo, they are able to release 1 million cubic feet if they need to. So his point to me is that even though we are very close to the maximum operating level of the dam, we are nowhere near releasing as much as we can release. Mm. So they are releasing 183,000 cubic feet, but they can release a million. But the catch is that the water level is at 277.26 mm. feet. And the maximum operating level is 277.50. Okay. So you need 0 0.26 feet to reach maximum operating level. Now, I'm six foot tall. <laughs> so you need 0 0.26 feet. So that's less than a foot. Less than a yeah. foot. About a fourth of a foot of water level to rise for the dam to reach the maximum operating yeah. level. Even short me. Yes. My height so, is so, more so, than that. So probably like this <laughs> level. Yeah. The other issue is that on Saturday, the water level rose by 0 0.12, which is half of the 0 0.2 for you need to reach maximum. Okay. So they are managing a very difficult situation. And I think we need to commend them as well. In addition to the fact that we'll talk about the preparation, if, if they don't spill the water, the dam will break. Mm. Now, if you have 1.5 billion cubic feet of water, which has been trapped with kinetic energy, yeah. everywhere from Akosombo to North Town, Central Town, South Town, Dangbe East, Dangbe West, mm. Shai Osudoku, all the way to Keta, will have 20 to 30 meters of water. Now, one meter, 1.8 meters is six feet. <laughs> yeah. 30 meters of water. So my point is, this is a very serious situation that VRA is managing. And people need to get that. That if the water is not spilled, you're going to have... <laughs> If the dam breaks, we are dead. That's what we're going to say. So, Brandon, let's, let's, let's stay on that point for yeah. a bit. I don't think a lot of people understand why we spill dams and yes. indeed what that actually means. Yeah. I mean, these are very complex structures. Yeah. There's a lot of technicality in there. Yeah. You can talk about turbines, all sorts of little yeah. fixtures that make up the dam. It's not just one big mm -hmm. container with water in mm -hmm. it, right? Yeah. So, let's stay there a little bit so that people can also understand why it when a dam needs to be spilled, yes. it needs to be spilled. And the last time the dam was spilled was in 2010. But the difference is that in 2010, we had had a drought. Mm. So the drought which led up to 2010 meant that there was a lot of water needed downstream. Okay. So when they did the spillage, the water was absorbed, absorbed. quickly. Mm. There wasn't that much rain coming in from the north, in addition to the fact that they were dry conditions. So according to engineer uh, Kenzo, the 2010 situation did not result in what we're seeing because of a dry spell. But we've had a lot of water. I interviewed a Ghana Meteo Agency two weeks ago and they said to me, we're going to have a lot of water everywhere in Ghana. There's a lot of rain in the north. So you are, going, you are having a lot of water already held coming in, more rains, and you are less than a quarter of a foot away from maximum operating level. Right? So the spillage had to be done. The question though is, was the spillage done it, were, were the people informed and asked to move before or they saw the water and had to move? But at least so far, nobody has died from what we know Thank from the space. So that tells you that part of the plan is working. And, and I think we need to be balanced in our analysis that, yes, the devastation has occurred, but the fact that everybody who has been affected has moved to a shelter tells you that there was some planning ahead of this. Now, 
my concern was that when they started spilling on the 15th and the water level was rising, they probably could have asked people to forcibly move right. so that there wouldn't be the level of devastation we see. But the point is that if the spillage is not done, the consequence will be worse for all of us. Mm. Having said all the things I've said, I think the most important thing now is to look at what can be done for the people Charles and Fred and Sander are interviewing, some of whose buildings have been inundated to the roof level. Yeah. Indeed, there's a video we saw, I think one of the videos, there's a guy you were talking to who was on a story building. Yes, yes. <laughs> so he he's on, on his roof. So he was on the roof. <laughs> and this um, is a story building. Yes. Yeah. They, so I, I, for them, we even asked them if, yeah, I mean, yeah. it was by choice that they were there, but they, what, they could have come to the community with, with a boat that canoes mm -hmm. around. I think we have images of what you're describing, where the gentleman was on the roof, on the story building. Um, we, we and there's a video that. on social media showing some people in a canoe with a woman giving commentary, mm -hmm. where the, the, the canoe is at the lintel level of a building, and then she's like, wow, wow, you can see the... The, the, the water has covered the whole community. Yes, we saw many of those instances where the water had completely flooded buildings. You, you yeah. would only see the roofing of the building. Yeah. It, was, it, was that, it was that high. Okay, so I mean, we're, we're dealing with a, a serious situation. Uh, before we even get to what we need to do for people and how we can move forward, I mean, Bernard, you've pointed out that some planning was in place. Charles, when you went into Mepe particularly, did you get the sense that people knew they were supposed to move? Did they feel like they were informed? Or do you get a sense that they knew what to do when this was going to happen? Well, it's, it's a very dicey situation because, I mean, from what we got from the people, they weren't informed well enough. That's what you picked yes, up? Yes, that's what we picked up. But um, from the VRA's perspective, um, they did enough um, sensitization. They went into the communities. But when you speak to the people, um, we went to a Sujaman on Saturday. Um, we were in a community called Kokontekweji. I spoke to the chief, and he said they were told about this village three days before um, the spilling, so they didn't have enough time to be able to, I mean, move out of there. And they are, I mean, primarily fish farmers, and they have set up ponds on the river. That's that's their main occupation, and they had lost everything. I mean, thousands of fingerlings. So we asked why didn't they move out and they said they didn't have enough time because it was just three days to the spilling and they couldn't move enough of the, of the, of the fishes. So I mean you get the VRA say that well we did enough but when you speak, go down there and speak to the people it's as though there wasn't enough education about it, there wasn't enough prior notification and so most of them were caught by surprise. Okay, so uh, Bernard, let me yes. come back to you. Yeah. Uh, we have a story on citynewsroom.com. It was published this morning about the fact that the, you know, Volta Regional Health Directorate yes. is worried about yes. possible epidemic, the, yes. the health implications yes. of this. And you know, a lot of the time we talk about dam spillages, we don't think about this. Yes. Waterborne diseases are a problem. Um, when you read the story, there are concerns about, apart from the waterborne diseases, the fact that latrines have been submer submerged. Yes. So that means literally fecal mm -hmm. matter is yes. now the floating yes. there yes. with yes. all sorts of things. Yes. I, and we were asking in our relief efforts for people to bring sachet and bottled water. Yeah. This is one of the reasons why we're doing that. Yeah. We do not want people to be drinking water. And a lot yeah. of them do drink yeah. from these water yes. sources around yeah. their communities. Yes. Um, let's talk a little bit about that. Have yeah. you heard, Bernard, um, in your discussions this morning or throughout the day with either the VRA or yes. NADMO, yeah. anything about this? Yes, yeah, so we spoke to Dr. Senanu Jokoto, who is the uh, Deputy Director of Ghana Health Service for the region. And it was a very graphic, I was with Sky this morning, and the, the, the issues were very clear. 12,000 people displaced at least. 25% of Mefe is underwater. Uh, in people, places like Mefe, they are uh, toilet facilities have been mixed up with the water. And as you rightly said, a lot of people depend on this water. So he's basically saying that uh, a humanitarian crisis will soon become a health crisis. Mm. That's the point he's making. And therefore, we need to start preparing. Now, to two possible things. Send water to the people so they don't have to use this water. So you need bottled or sachet water so they can at least have water to bath and drink without depending on this water. Then send them food as well because a lot of them, their livelihoods have been wiped out. They can't work and they don't have food to eat. All right. Then send detergents, send toiletries because they have to keep themselves safe. 
and then send medicine mm. because already hospitals are accommodating people. Indeed, some hospitals have had to move part of their mm. facilities mm. to accommodate people to sleep. So what he's anticipating is that if we don't get enough water to the pool on time, and some of them already depend on this kind of water to drink, you're going to have diarrhea. Mm. And once you have diarrhea, cholera, and all these things, you're in a big, big problem. Typhoid. So, right, right. so basically, they are preparing themselves for a possible health consequence, which is why we've added to the list, if you look on the screen, we want water of sachet and bag, bottled water. We want food which is canned or bagged, so you can send like um, tins of milk, you can send canned fish, then you can send bags of rice, sugar, things that you don't have to cook. Don't, don't send like, <laughs> you know, boiled plantain. You know, <laughs> send something that they can. Uh -huh. Then, very important, mattresses. Mm. Mattresses, because people are having to sleep in very rough conditions. Yeah. Blankets, the weather is cold. Toiletries, all right? And then medical supplies as well. Or you can send money, all right? Or you can send money. Now, we think that we need to use the media to drive attention. This is a national program. In fact, Sky was saying this morning that people should even volunteer to go there because even though the military is there, everybody is there, you need a lot of people to go and support. Absolutely. Because this is a major catastrophe that you're seeing. People, imagine if um, to uh, one fourth of Tesano is underwater. Do you know what that means? <laughs> That's like <laughs> over 500 houses. Yeah. So it's a very serious situation. People, and we are talking of children, talking of young ladies, talking of women. You Pregnant women. Yeah. I mean, one of the first things I came to, and maybe it's because I'm a woman, I'm a mother. What are the pregnant women going to do? It's terrible. You know, I mean, there's everybody, but there's also the, that. The and then the children, of course. Yeah. I mean, even the adults can't stand in the water. Mm -hmm. um, Charles, I'm going to let you go soon. But Bernard, before I leave this health note, um, the Ghana Medical Association has been speaking. And, of course, we saw that this morning, a very high-level delegation, with the president's chief of staff, was sent to or, you know, had made their way to the affected areas to go and inspect the damage. But the health minister wasn't a part of that delegation. No. And so the Ghana Medical Association <laughs> is calling, mm. you know, for the reasons that we've discussed, all the, 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 the health crisis that we anticipate may arise out of this and all, and all that, they are calling for the health minister to be involved. Now, granted, not everybody could have left their office to go and do this yeah. inspection. Yeah. But, I mean, you know, what's, what's your take on that? Well, for me, I, look, I don't want to personalize it yet. I mean, I was at an event this morning where the president attended. I'm told he came from the U.S. at 1 a.m. And he came for this event, which is a Ministry of Agriculture event, and he's going to go by chopper to the place. There's a lot of things happening. For me, because we've been covering this from Thursday, I can see how serious it is mm. directly. And because I've had the privilege to interview people who've been there, the VRA gentleman I was talking to the whole day, I don't even think he has slept. Mm. So once you go there, your mindset will change. Or once you, a lot of people are just seeing it in the news. Oh, people have been displaced. Mm. But until you start seeing the graphic images, you wouldn't know how crazy it is. So let's give them some time. There's a whole committee. I think, I think again, somebody said this morning that there should be a state of emergency declared in that area. Maybe when Sky comes to explain what that means. But I feel, I agree that there has to be, we can't, you can't do business as usual. Yeah. The reason we've done, the whole morning show today, we didn't do any live presenter mention. It was all about mm. the community. Branch in the city spent over one and a half hours doing the yeah. same thing. Right. We are here as well. The whole day, because the thing about media is that if you don't let people see how serious the situation is, people who are even downstream will not be warned. Of course. And already, even in the Anglo areas, the coast is bearing the brand. So debris from these places, broken bottles, broken pieces of wood, all go into the sea. Yeah. All right. So it's a major ecological disaster that we're seeing. So it's not business as usual. Mm -hmm. Everybody should step up. And I think the Ghana Medical Association and all these people, beyond the statements, the issue, they should rally their members to actually go and support the Ghana Health Service who's there, down there. You know what I'm saying? Because when you look at the faces of the not more officials and the Ghana Health Service put there, they are stressed. So um, in their statement, I mean, to be fair, the association did say that they are said we are mobilizing our members logistics and other resources to mm. support relief efforts mm. in the affected communities and will continue to monitor the situation. Wonderful. We appeal to corporate Ghana, Ghanaians, other stakeholders to support ongoing efforts to rescue the, and resettle the many people displaced by this tragic event. Um, but they're also calling for better coordination between the VRA, NADMO, uh, relevant government agencies, and then they themselves, so that they also know how to move. 
Yeah. Wonderful. Yeah. So, yeah. Apioko, there's a lot more coming up. I'm sure when we come back, we'll, deal, we'll delve into some specificities. We have the list of communities. So we've been studying the map very closely. And the tragedy is that a lot of the communities are close to the river's water course because of fishing. So if you look at, for example, Norton, the Norton map, a lot of the communities that have been devastated are just next to the river. Hmm. Right, Mefe is actually in some sort of yeah. So, yes, so look, you can so, see so, it on the map. So, so look at that. So yes. if I if I That's show right. you not to map, yeah. it's you're, you're, literally almost sitting on the bank. Yeah. yeah. So it's so we are talking about uh, places like Dofo uh, Adidome, Aveime, and then Vome, Tokotonu, and then of course uh, Mefe. So you look at and you, and this is a very good map because this actually shows you everything. So Aswajaman is the constituency where Atimpoku is. And Aswajaman, no, go back to the previous one. Go back to the previous one. Aswajaman, no, go back to the, the previous, previous map. map. So yes, Aswajaman is on your left. Now, after Atimpoku, you have Senchi, and the water comes all the way down. So Lower Manya is affected. Yellow Krobo will be affected. Shai Osudoku will be affected. So Shai Osudoku, you have uh, places like uh, Adakope, mm -hmm. Abuviekbon, and Abuvienu, all affected. Then you have Adan West. Mm -hmm. So basically the, 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 all the communities adjacent to the river. If you look at Bato. Yeah. All right. All the way down to Ketu South. So in the Volta region, you have the three town constituencies. You have Ketu South and Keta. Then you have Sai Osudoku. You have Yilo Krobo, Manya Krobo, and Sojaman. So about three eastern region constituencies. Mm -hmm. Two or three greater Accra and about four or five voter constituencies all affected. So it's, it's, it's across regions as well. Oh, yes. No, I mean, we're saying communities, we're saying districts, but it's also across regions. Yeah. Let's not forget that. Uh, we have a report that was done by you, Charles, um, where you spoke to a number of the, you know, the, the people who are living in these communities, specifically Mepe, okay. right, what they are going through, what their concerns are. It also includes the guy, the gentleman who was speaking about who is on top of top this of house. So let's take a look at that and then we'll come back to the studio. This is our, our this is our house. Then uh, when uh, the, the water come and uh, remove us, we, we climb the top of the, uh, this in our house. There is no place where we should pack our, uh, our uh, anything. So we are just you know, on top of the sunshine. And the, the, the sunshine also uh, 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 disturbing us. So this is uh, our issue. Uh, were you giving any prior information? Were you warned uh, before the spillage? Uh, uh, no, 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 no. There is no uh, this thing given to us. You were not given any notice? No, 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 no. Um, since this thing happened, how have you been faring? Have you had anything to eat? Have you been able to do any cooking or anything? And now, as we know that, uh, if you are coming here, you see uh, people uh, eating here. We are just uh, crapping here and there. some people, you see that our crew pot over there. And we are using it for cooking and, and everything. So basically, this is your this is your home now. I mean, yes, for the yes, yes. for the time being. Mm. Um, are you hoping that someone will come to your aid? Um, have you heard from Nadmo? Uh, Nadmo people came here yesterday, yesterday night. Yeah. Did they give you anything? No, no, no. They just gave, give us explanation. If uh, the water wants to disturb us, they should cramp. Yeah. And before they will find some solution to us and some place to. To go. Did you manage to cope? You seem a bit okay this morning. Mm, yes, I feel a bit okay. I packed my things to Bato. Oh, okay. So you've moved to the neighboring community, which is Bato. Yes, please. That's interesting. Have you ever witnessed such a thing before? No. This is my first time. But according to history, they say it has happened before. But around uh, 1968, thereabouts. That, that is quite a long time that I don't even think you were born by then. No, 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 no. no. Anyway, so a number of them here are waiting patiently on Nadmo. You see people paddling their canoe on the water just to access their home uh, at the other end. My concern is that uh, we used to initially access water from the main uh, river over there. But due to the spillage, we can no more at access the water from the other side. And... Uh, We've, we've been disconnected for, for, from, from using the, 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 the electricity we have in our town, which is a source of pumping the pipe that we, we get drinking water from. So as it stands, there's no drinking water in town. 
uh, we are calling on, on, on government to bring us drinking water and food because the food vendors cannot come out and sell for us because they don't even know where to locate their They are saving their lives and they've left all their food stuff inside the room and the water has come to us, take over from there. So it is making it so difficult for us to even get food and good drinking water. Since last night, I've not taken water. All right, welcome back. This is still City TV. My name is Apioko, and this is our special broadcast. We're talking about the Volta Dam spillage that happened over the weekend and the massive, massive devastation that it's caused across about three regions, several districts. Currently, we're saying that 12,000 people have been displaced. That's the update that we have. Um, very harrowing situation. City FM and City TV, we are running a relief campaign. We're asking for several items, which we, in collaboration with NADMO, we've spoken to NADMO, spoken to the VRA. We've determined that the people in these communities need at this time water, sachet or bottled. We need food. It should be canned or bagged, no cooked food. Food that, you know, has a bit of a longer shelf life and can easily be distributed amongst the people. Mattresses, blankets, toiletries, detergent, and medical supplies, very important. If you're just joining us, we were just talking about how, you know, it's been said, it's been established that this could easily become a health crisis for many reasons at the moment. And we need to make sure that we are on the beat and we help our own. I've been here with Bernard Avla. He's the host of the City Breakfast Show on 97.3 City FM. I've also been here with Charles Osukumi, who's, he went to Mepe, he's been on the ground with many others of the city team where the devastation has happened, where the spillage has affected people the most. We've also been joined by Richard Delasky. He's also a member of the team on the City Breakfast Show and, of course, very, very active with the City News team here at City FM and City TV. Richard, you're welcome. Thank you. Honored to be here. Yes, wonderful. Now, uh, before I go back to Bernard, Bernard was speaking about a number of things before you came, but I had a question for you. Um, I know you were also on air this morning on radio when you're speaking to the VRA. You know, there are conversations about whether since a lot of preparation had been done, there had been a simulation done in May because this was foreseen, could we have forcibly pushed people to move to the centers where, you know, they're, they're, they're being held for shelter now and that kind of thing? Now, my question for you is from a legal perspective, what would the legal implications have been? Why would we, you know, either say, okay, you know what, this is a situation we know is going to affect livelihood. It can affect your life. You can lose your life. So we are forcing you to move from your home to this shelter, a safe space in the interim. Is that something that we have the power to do? And which bodies or authorities do if that's the case? Well, uh, thank you so much. Um, well, if you look at the provisions of Article 31 of the Constitution, the President has the power to declare a state of emergency existing in a part of the country or all of the country. Now, there are a number of things that may 
cause the president to trigger that power, um, which would have to be exercised on the advice of the Council of State. Okay. So that if the Council of State doesn't so advise, the president cannot impose a state of emergency. Now, the Constitution makes it clear that natural disasters are one of those things that can cause the president to exercise that authority. And the president, within 72 uh, hours or so of de making that declaration, would have to put the factors compelling him to so declare a state of emergency before parliament. And parliament may either approve or reject okay. that declaration. Now, if, if you look at the situation we face presently, of course, the VRA says that it did some simulation exercise in, in, in May. And ahead of the spillage, it had informed the people to move. Uh, you heard my colleague here uh, suggest that some of the people say that they got only three days of advance mm -hmm. notice. I spoke to the Honorable uh, Member of Parliament for the uh, Norton constituency, the Honorable Kujetua Blackwa, who also raised serious and critical questions about how the VRA handled this, this whole matter. He suggests, for instance, when I was speaking, uh, I spoke with him uh, this afternoon on City FM, that um, members of the, the, the members of Parliament from the affected communities were at no point called mm. by VRA for them to actually understand v what VRA wanted to mm. do. And then there was no, in his view, a concrete engagement with the various communities. Mm. As in, oh yes, we did uh, simulation exercise in May, but there is imminent danger mm. and we intend to spill the dam in so, so, and so, and so time. And therefore, start doing A, B, C, and D. In his words, these things were not done. They were there, and then there was, uh, what do you call it, uh, notice that there had been spillage. Mm -hmm. And therefore, as we speak, members of parliament from the affected communities are putting together a major request, which request would insist that VRA has got to meet with them. They want to know the timelines that they were dealing mm -hmm. with. In other words, how long would it take for this particular disaster to continue? And that they also intend on insisting on comprehensive reparation from VRA. Again, if you look at our, our law books, for instance, there is a rule. Composition. Yeah, composition or, uh, what's the word? What, what yeah, word? Reparation. Ah, okay, compensation. Uh -huh. So that if, if this is not done, they may explore legal avenues to compel VRA to pay decent uh, compensation. So uh, in terms of the legal question you ask, the Constitution and Article 31 provides for state of emergency declaration to okay. be made by the president on the advice of the Council of State. After which that declaration would have to go before Parliament. Parliament would have to approve it. If Parliament approves it, it can take up to uh, three months for it to be renewed mm. or suspended entirely. And I must say that when that declaration is made, the Constitution allows for certain rights to be suspended. You have a right to move about freely. But when that declaration is so made, by the president and endorsed by parliament on the advice of, of the Council of State, then it is possible to forcibly remove you from, how, from okay. your house. Curfews can be declared and other things can be made or decisions can be made to compel you to act in a way that you would not ordinarily have been required to do under normal times. Okay, but I, you know, I, I, we really, we've spoken about the fact that we need to move forward and you know, see what we can do, what we should be doing so that we can fix the situation at hand. But I also think it's important for us to establish what we did not do right, what we have not been doing right, so that we don't have to come back to a situation like this again. Do you think that we just underestimated this thing and we we're treating it as business as usual and that's why we are where we are? Well, look at the water <laughs> behind you. For me, I, I, I think the, these are still early days. I say this because I don't think we've seen the West yet. Mm. Based on everything I know, I think a, a lot more water will be released. I mean, look at the volume of water. Yeah, you are releasing eight out of 12, um, what's the name of that? Valves. The, valves. Yeah. And yet the level is still rising. I mean, look at the water behind the It's like a waterfall. Spillage gates. Yes, spillage gates. It's like a waterfall. Right? So I feel, whilst it's important to talk about what's not done right, what's not done right, I think the attention should be focused on what is being done currently and what could even happen. Do you get me? Because, indeed, Sky, you forgot to say that when you interviewed a black guy, he said 
is no longer 25% of yes. Bepe. He yes. actually said over 70% 70 of Bepe wow. is underwater. Exactly. Wow. Because the 25% figure was from Saturday. Wow. <laughs> so according to the MP, mm -hmm. as of today, mm -hmm. it was almost as if the whole Mepe is going. Yeah. All right. So my point is that it's probably going to get worse before it gets better. So that's why our focus should be, let's try and get as many people as possible to either move. Because again, something I'll tell you. Today, Fred Wood tells us that the St. Kizito area that they are at, mm -hmm. there is a, another water body there, which has also overflown its banks. Yeah. Yeah. So the people who have been sent to a relief center could be encircled oh. <laughs> if the level rises. Mm -hmm. So they have to even move those people. Mm -hmm. So my, my point is that this is a situation that requires a lot of active work and collaboration. Let's save as many people as possible and prevent deaths. Yeah. Then we can focus on, that's why we are focusing on the relief effort. All right. Then we can now come to what could have happened and what we should have done. Mm. And I'm not saying let's not shouldn't hold people accountable, but what, the kind of situation we're seeing, and for me, whilst the VRA is careful to say that the dam will not break, mm. the reason I wasn't hopeful was that when I interviewed the gentleman in the morning and I asked him a direct question, I said, okay, if the water level rises by 0 0.12 for three straight days, what happens? Then he says, we hope that doesn't happen. We uh, hope. You can't, <laughs> hope you, you can't tell me that. We hope. You understand? So then later on, he said to me, look, we have released only 183,000 cubic feet, and we can release up to a million. Sky, so this is what I'm saying. Nobody sitting here or there can legislate how much rainfall will come. If the water level keeps rising, mm -hmm. they will open all the gates. If they open all the gates, do you know what one million cubic feet of water is? People will be inundated. Already, places have 70% of places gone. Mm -hmm. If you release one, and this one, it's 3,000, less than 200,000. So you are, you are doing less than a fifth. Mm -hmm. So if they actually do even 500,000, it is a yeah, crazy situation. Yeah. So it is, which is why it's a mix of an act of God and also human decision making. It's a very delicate situation. Mm -hmm. I am saying that let's focus our attention now on warning people, saving people, and helping people. Right? Warning, warning people, people, saving, saving people, people, and, and helping, helping people. people. Warn those who can move to move. Those who have been trapped, those who have been displaced, who can't come out of where they are, should be brought out. And then those who can be helped to survive, let's focus on that. So if you notice the tone of my interviews today, whether it was VRA I was talking to, whether it was NADMA I was talking to, look, if you're interviewing somebody who's in the middle of a crisis, you have to basically help them to put information out. Of course. The point Sky makes is very important. And I think when the president goes there today and he's giving the right information, I expect more serious action. Because the announcement of a committee seems very business as usual. It's like, oh, a committee by the chief of staff, 11 minutes. This is too big. It's too unwieldy. Come on. You're talking about this. The, the kind of thing you have here, you need to have 64 engineers regiment, mm. the military guys, the police. You, you are not, this is not minister no. issue. This is more, this is more boots it's on the ground issue. It's situation. Uh -huh. So I get the impression that the information being passed on to the chief executive of the country is more like, oh, we have a committee. If he, if he goes or if he watches what we are showing mm. and he watches it independently, I, I have no doubt that the approach will change because the, what you're seeing is not a 10 ministers committee work mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. at all. Mm -hmm. You should look at the face of the deputy NADMO coordinator from yesterday, mm -hmm. how stressed he was. Yeah. Look at the voter regional coordinator of Ghana Health Service, the deputy. I don't even think he slept for two days. That's strut. Yeah. So you, 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 yeah. <laughs> it is not 10 ministers matter at all. Mm -hmm. This is boots on the ground and the VRA must be assisted. Because when I was going to interview the VRA guy, he apparently he had gone on a helicopter very early in the morning and around eight, seven, seven something I was interviewing him. That was when the helicopter landed at Mepe. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right, so it's a very crazy situation. Just look at the water. It, it's, look, it's, it's something it's else. It's something else. And we have mentioned already that here at City TV and City FM, we're running a relief effort. We have a mobile money number, MTN mobile money number that you can use to send money. If you don't have MTN Momo and you just want some more information so that um, you can bring yourself to support, you can call 0205-973-973, 0205-973-973. And if you have your phone, you want to send something through right now, 0550-900-006, 0550-900-006. 
It's in the name Omni Media, and you can use the reference um, flood support. Flood support. That's mm -hmm. the reference you use when you send the money. And if you're watching us from beyond the shores of Ghana and you want to do something, again, you can call the number that I mentioned earlier, but prefix it with the country code plus 233. And we're live on air. We're talking about this. Look, you can send us a WhatsApp message, 020-444-7033, 7033 If you belong to any of these communities, you have family there, you have information that you think we don't have, we want to hear that as well. And again, if you're texting us from outside of Ghana, prefix the number with the country code plus 233. We do have some messages that have come through. Good afternoon, City FM, City TV. Please, my friends and I are organizing some 1,000 bags of drinking water. Please, can your station help by loading it from the factory to the affected communities that need it? Thank you. The location of the factory is Medina Ritz Junction. And this is from Julius Yagbe in Medina. Mm -hmm. And Julius, our team will be in touch with you. Yeah. We'll see how we can. What I'll say to Julius is that because we want to move everything from one place, it's easier if they brought it to city. To city. Because if we bring the trucks to city, then we'll move straight to the yeah. region. We don't so. want to have to go to Medina. Yeah. So as part of the sacrifice, if they can then bring the, yeah, the, bags. the materials to our Dabraka mm -hmm. office, then we can load them and send when we are going over there. Okay, so, the so Julius, you heard that. If you can mobilize you and your friends, bring these 1,000 bags of drinking water to City FM at Adabraka, behind the Adabraka Police Station, or to City TV, we're at Tessano, number five, Ola Hansen Lane, just next to the Crystal Palms Hotel Annex. Bring them here and then we'll mobilize and get them to the needed communities. Yeah. Okay. So let's come back to the studio. Yeah, Richard, you I, I want to say want something? I just want to mention that in terms of, uh, what do you call it, uh, donations, yeah. uh, I want to mention um, 200 bags of cement. I'm just seeing a story on City FM, citynewsroom.com. Cement, did I say cement? Yes. Right. Oh, it's actually 200 <laughs> bags of rice. Rice. Rice, okay, okay. rice, <laughs> rice, yes. I think you are building a house. Yeah, I think I was God bless you. I'm building a house. <laughs> because my mother's home is, 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 is being affected. Yeah. Uh, but the deputy majority leader in power, Wonderful. Honorable Alexander Penyo Marking, 200 bags heeding of rice. our call yes. um, for support, is yeah. donating 200, 200 bags of rice. 25 kg wonderful rice wonderful okay. to support Scott, but you haven't said anything wonderful. about seva and this you know after call, there's already a tidal wave problem mm. Mm. in lower volta and as i said we have images mm. from the coast showing devastation from debris mm -hmm. and there's already a tidal wave problem in places in southern volta so the spillage has other effects yeah. Yeah. I saw footages of, for example, Alka Safari with a lot of water there. Yeah. Yeah. The other problem I've been said to you is that even nothing of the Volta. This morning, a gentleman called Abraham Lincoln sent me a video from Setra Afram Plains. Mm -hmm. He mentions a couple of towns where the water level has risen to the point that they are having problem moving. Yeah. He says island communities in the Setra Afram Plains because once the water is not going as fast yeah. as it should, it's like yeah. you have water in a basin it's that's now, not draining quickly yeah. enough. So everybody up. upstream is also yeah. affected. Yeah. So we should not see this as just a southern Akosombo issue. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, when I spoke to Okujeto Ablakwa, the member of parliament for Norton, mm. uh, during our uh, broadcast on, on, on CTFM, he made that point that a number of members of parliament from up north mm -hmm. um, and the Afram Plains area have called to say that because we ha we are restraining the flow of the water, <laughs> <laughs> the water is moving backwards. You know, water find its own. Mm. And mm. it is reaching homes, attacking businesses, churches, and all of these communities, including those in the uh, so, so Yes, through East, you have Setre uh, Central, mm -hmm. Drobonso. Mm -hmm. And if, if you look at the map, everywhere a tributary, so Sine and Pru, empty themselves into the Volta. Mm -hmm. So, the, so the, the places are Oti, mm -hmm. Sine, Pru, and Afram. Uh -huh. These are the main tributaries to the Volta. Sine oh. is in uh, Bono, East. Bono East, Pru is in Bono East, Oti mm -hmm. is in the North, uh, um, Oti region mm -hmm. plus uh, Northern region. Yeah. So these are the four, and then you even have the Black Volta, and then the Red Volta coming into the 
uh, the, the, the country as well. Exactly. Okay, and so all of these communities are having problems. So now, at this point, so uh, Sky, not to cut you, but mm -hmm. at this point, I want us to go through the list. We have a full list of affected yes. districts and communities. Yes, Let's Charles has the list. Charles list. has the list yeah. for us. So we'll take the region, the district, and mm -hmm. then the community. Charles has the list. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Okay, so in the North Tong um, districts, we have Mepe. That's the Volta region. Yeah, in the Volta region. We have Mepe, we have Vome, um, Tokotonu, um, we have Siko, um, Memoni. Are you sure Sky should be all these things? Sky, you know what? This, this, this is we have Avaime, we have Avaime. Avaime, um, mm -hmm. we have Volokome, um, Dofo Adidome. Dofo Adidome. And then um, also in the Volta region, in Central Tongue, there's Awadiwo Kome, um, Siame Kome, um, we have uh, Devime, um, Kepenu, um, Atem, Atem Kope, Aho Kope, um, Apoko, well. Apoko, well. Kope, Sky, okay. um, okay. Old backpack. No, no, no. Uh, Charles, Sky. Charles, which is that? Uh, I, I need, I need help from Sky. Are you from? 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 Uh, I'm from Acropolis, the eastern region. Okay. Because the names here will break your job. <laughs> yeah. Sky, please help yeah. us. Um, then, where are the way the south, so, he's, south, 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 south. so it's in Central Tong. Yeah. So, yeah. Yes. so now so we're in South, south Tong. Yeah. So we have South Tong. So we have Amutinu, Amuto, Avegome. South Tong. Yeah, that's right. So. Uh, Zewenu, uh, Afokpenu, uh, Agome, Agodome, mm -hmm. uh, and then we have Fievie, Sugakopen North, Tefle. So all this is so, South Tongue? Yeah, yeah. Sokwe, Vume, and then Cha, Chu, Kofe, and then we have Alike Kofe mm. uh, also in there. Now, if you move to uh, the Greater Accra area, Shai Usudoku uh, district to be specific, you have Abu Vienu, uh, you have Ada Kofe, mm -hmm. and then also Abu Vie Pong. Mm -hmm. uh, those are the areas affected in the Shai Usudoku right. uh, district. Mm -hmm. Then you move to the eastern region. And Omar Osanda is in Shai Usudoku, as we speak, exactly. doing some reports there. Uh -huh. In the eastern region, we have the Isujaman district affected. And then the areas specifically affected include. G Jokofe. I don't know for some reason all oh, the names yes. are yes, I yeah, mean, that's, yeah. that's the beauty Joku, of Ghana. Uh, mm -hmm. also affected and there are Himbrum, uh, also part so of the So if you look on the map on the screen, mm -hmm. this is a very good map because it tells you this is the lake and the dam. So the dam is at Atimpoku where the red the red dot is. So everywhere north of Atimpoku is in danger if the water doesn't spill. So you're looking at places like Impakadan. Uh, you mm -hmm. are looking at Jekiti. Mm -hmm. You are looking at places like even Anum mm -hmm. Boso. Boso. Because mm -hmm. it's like the, the water goes through a gorge. They, they, they dam the gorge. Mm -hmm. Right? So if you, if you release the water, and I need to tell you that there were 51 communities that were created after the um, dam was okay. built. Because all the communities above Atimpoku they were just rivers. Mm. So there was a lot of people who were living in where the water is. Right. And they had to be moved to new communities. So there were 51 settler communities. I wanted to mention like settler communities for you to give you a sense of the seriousness of this situation. Mm. So places like Yape and Yeji mm -hmm. were, and Dambai were all created after the, the after the, of the construction the of the, the dam. Because those communities were people who were living where the lake now is. So there's a river. All right. So there's a map I have with 52 communities Pegusu to Vakpo. Okay, so Ben, I just be clear, this is 52, not 51. 52, 52 communities. 52 communities okay. created after the lake was formed. And these are communities further away from the area of the lake. Because the problem for those who were above Antipoku is that they were, they had too much water taking over where they lived. So a lot of the communities you see on this map were newly created communities because of the lake created. Mm. Now, if the water doesn't flow and it, it's forced to expand, then those places get flooded. So it's a balancing act between the north and the south. We have a map that I don't know if Hansen has it, a map which shows you the 52 communities created because of the, the dam. Okay. Todome, yeah. Vakbo, we, we um, what do you call it? Uh, Amankwakrum, mm -hmm. Dambai, Pandai. Okay. Uh, Prang, mm -hmm. Yeji, Mankongo, Kafaba, Yapei, 
Botoku. And these are, these, some of these Senchi. names are familiar. Right. So, all, you know? these, Edukrum, all these communities were settler communities Along that there. people had to move into because the dam was created, 52 mm -hmm. of them. Mm -hmm. So my point is that these are supposed to be safe havens, yeah. a good distance from the lake. So if you don't manage the flow and the lake overflows its bank, that's another problem you're creating mm -hmm. as well. So there's a lot of different things that VRA has to manage this uh, season whilst the, 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 the water is being released. And then there was a point you made much earlier about the situation down south. Yes. Apioko, if you remember, Consistently, we've been talking about how tidal waves are decimating Absolutely. communities along the eastern coast of yeah. Ghana. So you're talking about from Aplau mm -hmm. right down to Anyangwe, the Ketu South, uh, the Ketu South yeah. constituency, and then Keta and North constituency, mm -hmm. and then you come to parts of the Greater Accra region in the other areas. You know the confluence mm -hmm. of the, the the sea, the Atlantic Ocean, and the Volta River. It's around the Anyangwe area, mm -hmm. which is separated by the vast, you know, Volta, mm. uh, which has the Greater Accra region or the Ada areas on one, mm. one side, and then the Volta areas on one mm. side. Now, if you look at the Ghana map, you will notice that there is a small strip of land that connects from the Anyangwe areas right up to Aplau. Right. Mm. Now, immediately behind mm -hmm. the plot of land I'm talking about, the strip of land I'm talking about, is the vast Keta Lagoon mm. and mm. associated mm. lagoons mm. already also inundated mm. by water. And then you have, you know, tidal waves mm. bashing the people. So Keta at some point had to be completely relocated or largely relocated because of tidal waves. Mm. Then the Rawlings administration that intervened good. with, um, you know, sea defense project, which to some extent alleviated mm. the plight of the people. But the sea is back wreaking so much havoc. So you have places like Agaveji, uh, Konu, Keta, the Seva areas also having their own problems. Then you have uh, places like Adina, uh, uh, Adafianu, Denu. All of those communities continue to be under siege from the tidal waves. Now imagine, imagine the situation now getting to where it is now. Excess water flowing into the area overpowering the, the level of, of, of the Keta Lagoon and also going into the sea, possibly raising the levels. So you would imagine that these communities are under serious, serious, serious siege as we speak. So we can only pray and hope mm -hmm. and then work towards ensuring that we will reduce as much as possible the impact on the people. Because my mom called me, mm -hmm. you know, the water has actually gone into her house, both in the Adafianu area which is in the Ketu South constituency. And then when you go to her, 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 her father's hometown, which is Seva, which is my, my maternal side, the only road that leads to the community, you are talking about Anyaku to Seva, we are told that the level of the water made it possible for the road to be inundated. And so that community is also cut off. Cut off. If, if what I'm hearing from, so from I just, the region I is, just is, 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 sent, is to be believed. I just it's, sent to Hansen mm -hmm. the... Um, map of Keta, which I thought will help you. The map your, of Keta. Yes, the, the Keta municipal map is, no. up, and they'll show it. It will show you the precarious, so basically <laughs> there's a strip of land from Keji mm -hmm. all the way to Jita, mm -hmm. which basically is in danger mm -hmm. already from the lagoon. Yeah. So you can so see you, it. So yes, this, this thing. The, okay, there <laughs> so go. check it out. So, you've got so the Sky, if you can walk us through there. this, if you can walk us through this, I'm going to show us on the screen uh -huh. where your hometown is and what's happening. It will okay. help us a lot. So go, go to the screen Okay, and show so us. what you... <laughs> <laughs> at least you recognize this, right? Yeah. Good. Yes, so, so go and show us what's happening. Uh, what you have here is basically the, the map of the Keta area, right? Let's move a bit to this area. Now, uh, it does not include the Ketu South Constituent. This is just Keta. This Ketu is just South is Keta. on the right. Yeah, so Ketu South, you have Ketu South uh, on, yeah. on this part. Yeah. Now, you are talking about the Keji, and we sometimes refer to it as Keji Copper. Okay, okay, this way rather. Uh -huh. yes, As you move to this way, side. Yeah. Yeah. So, so we start from so, Anyangui. Yeah, so I was talking about Anyangui. So this is where you have the confluence between, um, what do you call it, the Volta River, and then also the Atlantic Ocean. Mm. And turbulence sometimes you know, it's dangerous. This is around the area that we lost uh, the, the musician okay. uh, on, on. So this on is just next to Ada. Yeah, this is just next so to Ada. So Ada is next to, so this is, this is Ada, this is South. Uh, exactly, exactly. So, so that is what you have. When you move from there, 
you have jitter. Mm. Now you look at the space in between. There it is, is not, so not so much, so much. Yeah. Uh, a big a big land. And this whole area, we're yeah. talking about the Gulf of Guinea or the Atlantic oh, Ocean, yeah. as you sometimes refer to it. Yeah. So if this place is elevated, the water here, the lagoon here is elevated, the Volta Lake is elevated, all the Keta thing. Lagoon is also elevated. What it the means is that area. all these areas are likely to be wiped away. Yeah. Because you have the Atlantic Ocean or the Gulf of Guinea, and then you have the Qatar Lagoon now expanding in this reach, decimating all of these communities or entirely wiping them out. And I need to say that this week, I have friends who have tourism facilities in Wei Tegui, and they are telling you that the water level has risen to mm -hmm. sometimes the heart. Mm -hmm. <laughs> So even before all that water comes, there's mm -hmm. already a challenge with some, because mm -hmm. as soon as the Volta Lake gets down here, mm -hmm. more water here means everybody here is in danger. Uh -huh. So all the way here to Sketu South mm -hmm. is, in, is in danger. And then I was saying, so you see, you have a TRV here, mm. a TRV. Yeah. Now in here, you have the Anyako areas. Mm. Mm. Then my mother's maternal, um, you know, What's that island called? It's Seva. Oh, that's, okay, so that's the island. Yeah, so, so that's Seva. So she's on the island. Uh -huh. So she's on the island. Wow. Now, the, the, there's a road connecting Anyaku to uh, oh, what do you call Seva. it? Seva. It used to be a complete island. When I was growing up, when we were going there during uh, what do you call it, holidays, you go by boat. You or couldn't dinghy. drive a car there. Exactly. Now, somewhere came in and then they were able to build a feeder road to the area. Okay. Now, we're told that by reason of the inundation we're seeing, that's the road is somewhat submerged completely. Wow. So the people are somewhat cut off if the reports we are getting from the area is anything to go by. So there's a major crisis looming wow. along the entire stretch of this area. And then if you go further north, you are heading towards the Ketu South area. I'll find the Ketu South map for you uh, as you well. Know, being decimated. Wow. So, so it is actually a small strip of land. Wow. Where is Angloga? Uh, so Angloga should be somewhere here. Uti on yeah, the, okay, Uti, so yeah. There, Angloga there is here. I see. Yeah. Well, this Sky, is, this is, I mean, this is thank graphic. you. <laughs> but, but this is what pictures do, right? Yeah. They, they bring the reality right to you. And uh, look, it, it's... It is, it is scary. I, I, I it's don't scary. know. Very, very scary. I don't know. Very, and very you see, these are a, a lot of the people who live in these communities already disadvantaged in so many ways. Yeah. Yeah. Even without talking about the water and all the things mm -hmm. that you just described, mm -hmm. Sky. We're dealing with serious economic issues. They're bearing the brunt of it. Yeah, we're and dealing... talking about economics, right? No, can you go back? If to you the can map. put the, the put map, the map back, back for us, please. Don't take our map away. We want our map. <laughs> so this is the... this there is we way. go. Yeah. So okay. you see, because of the vast nature of the Keta Lagoon, which takes its, um, you know, the source of water partly from the Volta Lake and all of that. Yeah. What you have is a lot of the people along the stretch rely heavily on, mm. yeah. on, on the lagoon to mm. do fishing. Yeah. And you have marshy areas that they mm. also use for, for sugarcane okay. farming, mm. you know, coconut farming, shallots, uh, shallots okra, and all of that. Mm. So if this place is elevated because of the quantity of water in there, all these farms are gone. Wiped away. Wow. They are wiped away. And then also they cannot go fishing because when the tide goes up, you know, fishes for some reason, uh, you can't find them. Mm. And then also, because of the artisanal nature of the fishing they oh. do, mm. they cannot engage heavy-duty fishing equipment to be able to go, uh, go after the, the fishing. Mm. So they are also impacted in that way. And then also, along the coast, as I said, the tidal waves are unfriendly these days. So to even go you know, onto the sea and then fish is also a major headache. Mm. It is the people who use, they call them the watcher people, they use the outboard motors who are able to sometimes brave the storm and then the aggression of the tidal waves to go up there and then do some fishing. You know, they do the dragnet fishing mm. majority of the times. And when the sea is aggressive, they are unable to do it. So wow. we are talking about so many people wow. whose livelihoods will be wiped away by reason of what is happening. Yeah, and if we're also looking at a potential continues. famine down there. <laughs> you yes. know, that, that's that's mm. the truth of the matter. Mm -hmm. wow. You know what? We, so Sky, thank you for that. Thank you for painting that the very lesson. graphic picture. <laughs> but the reality of the situation. Uh, we have a few reports. There is the um, Seji Saji, the NADMO deputy director, um, you know, talking about where people are sleeping at the moment. Mm -hmm. We also have um, a report or, you know, a snippet from Ejapa Mercer yeah. on the government's plans 
for what we're going to do here on out. So let's take a look at that and then we come back and we continue the discussion in studio. We have recorded inundation of homes in Isu Jaman, so some level of displacement there, but we don't have people move to safe havens yet. We have recorded uh, displacements also parts of Angron. They have also not moved people to safe uh, havens yet. Also, we have displacements in uh, South Town, which is one of the hardest hit. But luckily, we have also not moved people to safe homes yet. Majority of the people, we, as of this morning, we are recording close to about 3,005 plus displaced people in South Town. But luckily, most of them are with their relatives. And the NADMO team is working to serve them with leave items that we have uh, prepositions there. Now, the hardest hit is Central Town and North Town. Central Town already has uh, about 3,000 plus people in safe havens as we speak. Then for North Town, we have close to almost uh, 4,000 plus in safe havens. San Quisito is holding the largest victims, which is getting close to 1,000. It's about 1,000 now as we speak. Um, I don't know if I could list the communities, but there are several. But as I said, it is North Town and Central Town that is hardest hit. But what is very, very important for us, which NADMO together with VRA, we started doing before the water was spilled, and we want to continue doing, is to warn people who are still at places that the water has not reached yet. The spillage is still ongoing. It is possible or most likely that the water will get there. We want to use this medium to let everybody know that they have to move as a matter of agency. This unfortunate turn of events has led His Excellency the President, Nana Adedan Kwakufuadu, to set up an interministerial committee to manage the effects of the flooding with the aim of ensuring the protection of life and properties of the affected people and ensure the victims have, adequate, have adequately been catered for. Indeed, prior to the spilling, and as required by the VRA's emergency preparedness plan, VRA notified all the relevant stakeholders, including the National Disaster Management Organization, the municipal and district assemblies, and particularly the downstream communities, to ensure that the communities responded to the notification. A VRA team collaborating with officials from NADMO were tasked to monitor the impact of the controlled spill on the downstream communities and regularly assess the water levels and spill rates. This measure has the sole objective of safeguarding the laws of lives and properties. The rationale behind this initiative was to enhance community resilience through education and awareness. The multifaceted approach deployed by the authority ensured that the spill was managed effectively, prioritizing the safety and well-being of the downstream communities while safeguarding the integrity of the dam. Again, it is instructive to note that before the decision to spill, VRA in May 2023 had held a simulation exercise dubbed Exercise Dawohoso 2023. All right, this is still City TV. If you're just joining us, we're doing this live broadcast to sort of bring the nation up to speed on what we are dealing with, the reality of the situation on the ground when it comes to the Volta Dam spillage that happened over the weekend. We're told that over 12,000 people have been displaced. That's where we are at. A little earlier, the Navy, the Ghana Navy, did say that they had rescued about 8,000 people. Thankfully, we haven't recorded any deaths yet. We're grateful for that, but people are struggling. Uh, you just heard from Seji Saji, he's a NADNO deputy director, 
and he was telling us where people are sleeping, the kind of relief efforts that are happening on that front. We've seen images of people who have climbed their roofs just trying to stay above the level of the water. We've also heard from Honorable Eja Pamesa, he's the Member of Parliament for Second D, talking about government's plans going forward, how we can address the situation. And indeed, here at City FM and City TV, we are running a relief campaign, and we need your help as our viewers and our listeners. Look, we're looking for water, sachet and bottled water. We're looking for food. It should be canned, bagged. We don't need any cooked food at this point. We need food that can you know, last a little longer, has a longer shelf life because we don't know what the situation is out there. Um, and we also need to be able to distribute these items quickly and easily. Mattresses, because clearly people need a place to lay their heads. Blankets, they need to stay warm. Toiletries and detergent medical supplies very very imperative the mobile money number to send your donations to if you are willing and able at this point is 0550-900-006 0550-900-006 the name on the account is omni media that is the umbrella company for city fm and then the reference you should use is flood support flood support. If you don't have a mobile money number to use, you can call 0205-973-973, 0205-973-973. That is our hotline. If you have questions, you're not sure whether there's something you want to send through, you're not sure whether it makes the cut, whether it's actually needed at this time, you can ask a question on that number. If you need help as to locate us either at City FM, behind the Adabraka Police Station in Accra, or at City TV, Tessona, number 5 Ola Hansen Lane, here in Accra as well. We can give you that information via that hotline too. And if you have just generally any, any requests, any questions, any support, it's something that you think we haven't thought about, but we should be thinking about regarding this situation, please do call that magic number. Now, I have a studio with me, Bernard Avler, he's the host of the City Breakfast Show on 97.3 City FM. We also have Charles Owusu-Kumi with the City News team, and he has been with the team at varying points on the ground, witnessing firsthand what is happening to people as a result of this dam spillage that happened over the past weekend. We have Richard Delasky. He's also on the City Breakfast Show. He's also with City News. He's our resident lawyer and our resident Volta regional expert. So, <laughs> you know, he's been mentioning the name, showing us the topography yeah. that we're dealing with, the geography yeah. of the Volta region, which is one of the three main regions that has been affected by this. So we have another map on the screen at the moment. Mm -hmm. It's the map, the district map of K2 South. Mm -hmm. Now, if you missed us a few minutes before we went on the break and we took these reports, Sky was outlining for us how there is a confluence, you know, somewhere down south of the Gulf of Guinea, that's the Atlantic Ocean, right? Yeah. We've been dealing with tidal waves there for several years now, and in recent times, it's become more profound and, you know, more dangerous for people to live in those areas. We have the Ketu Lagoon as well, which is also around there. And then now we're dealing with the Volta Lake, which is being spilled. So it really is a nightmare, the mother of nightmares for us in Ghana when it comes to water disasters at this time in the present. And Sky has the map in front Another of him. He's going to run us through. Yeah, yeah. so um, I just spoke to you about the Keta Municipal Area and the Anglo areas, um, you know. And then I'm now moving to the Keta South. Hmm. This is my paternal side. Oh. <laughs> so, so we are, so we are literally doing side, 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 side. side. <laughs> The way God is sharing that is no good. Now. <laughs> <laughs> so the paternal side is also under siege. Oh, yeah. Now the red lines you see, these are the main roads, mm -hmm. right? The main roads connecting the various communities. So if you are coming in from Qatar, you get to a place known as Blekusu. Mm. It, is, it also has a certain confluence of its own around this particular area. And then this whole area, the places that you see the red lines, so there are communities in some of these areas. But this whole area is full of what you can call the Ketu Lagoon. Oh, okay, because so there's more it's water. A wetland, exactly, it's a wetland. Now, the wow. only di distance you see, really, is about a few meters from the main road to this side, a few meters from the road to this side. And then a strip of land in between from here 
in between the red, you know, the, the and then the sea, and then the, and the sea. So this hole where you see the blue line, that's the seashore. The blue line is the wow. sea, and the red line is the road. Exactly. Oh, then the road wow. will go. So the road, yeah, that's, yeah, right. yeah, that's it. And, and in fact, if you go to say uh, communities <laughs> like Agraveji, right, they have been wiped away almost entirely. Oh, that is what informed the repeated calls that come in from Honorable Ablagomashi yeah. for the oh. need to, 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 to do some, uh, what do you call it, uh, sea defense project mm -hmm. in that particular area. And Adina area. as well. So where yeah. is the sea yeah. defense that she was talking about? So that one, you have it in the Keta okay. and the Angola. So now Blekusu to Adina needs a sea defense. Yeah, that's right. So okay. Blekusu, that is the immediate, the, the community you find after Azizaji. Yes. So there's a community here known as Azizaji. That's where you have the, the confluence I was talking about. Yeah. Then you have Blekusu. Then Agaveji. All of these communities are fishing communities. Wow. Then you have Adina. Adina, it's also been decimated over the years, in recent yeah. years. By water from the bottom. Exactly. And then also, because we now have some salt mining going on in the oh. lagoon. Mm. We are told that some Indians have been mm. given mm. some mm. dodgy mm. rice mm. to come and mine salt there. And they have dug many, many, many big holes in, in, in the lagoon. And that, people are falling inside and dying and all kinds of things are happening. So you move from there, you go to Adina, which is also a fishing community. Mm -hmm. From there, you go to a number of communities, including Deviti Kofi and all of that. Then you get to Adafi, and this is where I come from. Yeah. This is oh. where my... my, my so which one, is three which one is Three Town? So Three Town <laughs> is a combination of the district capital, which is Denu. Uh -huh. okay. Denu. And then you have Hejranao. Okay. Oh. Hejranao, no war. Uh -huh. And then and Adaf Adafian. Oh, so those are the three towns. So exactly. Three towns. <laughs> wow. Uh, These three towns, you know, came together to set up the three town senior high school okay. where I, I went to secondary school. So from Denu, you go to Vieffe Avouiman and then all the way to Akawa. Wow. And it is just a slim strip of land. Mm. Mm. So in between very, very, the red line at the bottom mm -hmm. and the network of red lines, it's a, it's a, a marsh. Yes, it's a marsh. It's a marshy area full of. Uh, you so know. that's that's supposed to be a wetland it's that a wetland. absorbs, absorbs and, exactly. and, and now you have exactly. the salt mining going yes. on. So going if on. you do that, so this wow, is like this the is sponge. So wetlands are the sponge mm -hmm. of the earth. Mm -hmm. Mangroves and wetlands, they absorb water so that it does not decimate the, the land. So when you start encroaching on a wetland, uh -huh. you are destroying the sponge abilities of the land. Exactly. Yeah. That's the issue. Exactly. That's the issue. Exactly. Mm. And, and all of this area, people go there to fish, catfish, and then tilapia, and all that's where they go to. But because of the salt mining now, people are unable largely yeah. to do that. So I wanted them to show the Keta map, so I will show you something. Mm -hmm. okay, so, so you are having tidal waves from the south, mm. and then you are having water release from the north. Mm -hmm. right. So the reason why Ketu South and Ketu, uh, Keta are... And, 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 these people are in trouble is that. The Volta, the Volta, <laughs> the Volta mm -hmm. River ends up somewhere here. Yeah. So if you have water from the Gulf of Guinea pushing up, mm -hmm. and then you have water coming up, it means that all those from Anyanwi, all the way to Keji and all those places, they are, they are under threat. So it's like you have water from the south and mm -hmm. from the north. Mm -hmm. So it's a serious environmental, climatic, ecological situation mm -hmm. that needs to be dealt with very seriously. You know, it's, it's a... It I, I wish they would show me also the the Shai Osudoku map later, and we'll okay, show you a few so, things so there. So we, we, can, we can look for that, the Shai yes. Osudoku map. But, oh, there it is. Yeah. Okay. So I just wanted to show you the, the, the way this, okay. this whole thing is. So, you know, this is uh, North Tong. This is where the greatest devastation has occurred. Yeah. So Umaru Sanda is now in Shai Osudoku, where there's also a, little, a lot of land. You mentioned three communities yeah. in the Shai Osudoku areas. They are closer to the North Tongue area. Mm -hmm. So this is actually a national it, problem. It is. I, I'm Bernard and Sky and Charles as well indeed. Mm -hmm. my, my husband comes from Kotoko, which is when we would say it's in Akuse. Mm -hmm. It's in there. It's very close to the river. Yeah. And over the, just phone calls upon phone calls about how family members had been cut off. They were supposed to be coming to Accra for an event and they couldn't make it. Mm -hmm. So it's, ver it's been very real for a lot of people. Mm -hmm. This is not the kind of thing I can say, oh, I live in Accra, so I don't care. Or I live in Tamale, so I'm mm -hmm. not bothered. Mm -hmm. It is a national And, and these are settlements. And you notice that the settlements are closer to the Volta. Mm -hmm. You see, the settlements are closer. Asuchari, this is where Umaru Sanda is mm -hmm. from. This is where we have rice and sugar cane. Mm -hmm. So the, the 
agricultural activities that depend on a lot of water, rice and sugar cane, usually will have a lot of farming communities. So when you're driving to Accra from Akosombo, when you get to Asuchari, you notice that when you turn right. So all of these are settlements which depend on the Volta. Awesome. So as soon as the Volta runs its banks, these communities are in danger of annihilation. And then rice farms and sugarcane farms are all in danger of destruction mm. as well. And for those who, who, who live in that, so this is Dodowa. So mm. all of this is Shai Osudoku. But these are the portions. So Noton is the key. Noton is the key. If you have the Akosombo one as well. I see my hometown there, you know. Where, where is your hometown? Home. I come from Kuhu. 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 on sea. Okay. So we are actually on the sea. Okay. Okay, so where, where is your hometown? Oh, so we are down there. So, so we are before Pram Pram. Okay, no, this is Ningo Pram Pram. Okay, yes, that's, so that's a different... Ningo, that's different. I wanted them to show me the Akos, the Asojaman. The Asojaman. Just to show other areas. So there's a lot of issues here. Charles was mentioning the communities in... Yes, so this is now a soldier okay, man. There we Again, go. so we have that from. Now, France. this is the point. The Volta Lake was formed because we built a dam in a gorge. All right, so that the water flows in, in gorges and comes all the way. And I'm saying that there were a lot of people who were living in all these places. When the dam was formed, they, the water covered the tops of the trees. All right, now if the water doesn't flow from here, Places like Anum and Boso, not far from Peking, my hometown, yeah. will be affected. My if I will go hometown, up, yeah. Pando Toko is next, next to, to. Mm -hmm. yeah. right? So if you, if you talk about the Volta Basin, it is a national picture we are painting, all right? Now, the train that is being done from Tema, it ends at Impakadan. This is Impakadan. So the idea is that when the train gets here, if you bring yam or whatever from the north, it gets here, you take it to, and then if you are taking goods from the south to the north, it gets to Impakadan. So this is the whole idea, all right? Now, look at Sinchi, look at Akrade. All of these places are next to the water body. So the way this works is that, for economic activity's sake, the closer you are to the water, the better, mm. because of fishing, because of transportation, because of tourism. So there's a lot of tourist facilities next to the water, a lot of agriculture. So in a sense, we've been lured by the water to come close to it. Mm. So when the water overflows, then we are all dead. <laughs> 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 if you look at the geography of all the maps we've shown you, people tend to settle close to the water because either they are fisher folk or they do tourist attractions or things because they depend on the water. Mm -hmm. And that's what endangers us. So look at all this. Look at this. This is Akosombo. So the Adomi Bridge is at Atimpoku. So when you are going to the Volta region from Accra, you either use the Sogakope Bridge, which is in South Tong, which which bridge I'm told the water is less than four feet close to, or you. To be fair, the Atimpoku Adomi Bridge is much higher. Higher, very high. Because it's it, it's done over two mountainous areas. So I don't think the Adomi Bridge is in any serious danger yet, but the Sogakope Bridge is a smaller bridge and it's much closer. So communities around Akosombo, Akwemufie, Apegusu, Frankedua, Asikuma, all of these are very close to the Volta. Mm. And if this water does not go, there's going to be a problem up Further there as well. Up. So Further that's up. just to give you a picture of, of the map. And I think the final picture will be South Tong, if they can show us the South Tong, for those who don't know, just to show them the, yes, yeah, so this is South Tong, if you're traveling, this central tongue or no, this is south tongue. This, this is south tongue. So if you are traveling to the Volta region from Greater Accra region, the Sogakofe Bridge. So this is Rawlings' house, mm -hmm. Teple. Mm -hmm, definitely. All right. Yeah. So when you are from Ada, the first town you get to before there's a place called Vume where they sell flower, flower pots. pots. Then you get to Teple. Then you cross the bridge to Sogakofe. Now this bridge is a much lower bridge than the. So there are two main entry points to the Volta region from the south. The Sogakofe Bridge and the Adomi Bridge. Mm -hmm. Adomi Bridge is at Timpoku. The Sogakofe Bridge is a much lower bridge. And today Fred Duo was telling us that a canoe cannot go under the bridge. Mm -mm. Based on where the water level the has water reached. Has a canoe high. cannot... I mean, Sky, you don't have flat a canoe. Oh, yeah, that's right. He says you can't push you a think? canoe mm -hmm. under the Sogakofe Bridge. Without knocking that's the That's the point, at least this morning. Where Fred... Yes. So... As of this morning, a, a canoe cannot pass under the Sugarcoffee Bridge. So, Bernard, sorry, not to... Charles, so when you were there on Thursday, were you able to pass under it? Yeah, it didn't look anything. It was like fine. That. And it means that... So, I mean, so that's the water level. Yeah, so the water passed. level has really risen. So, a, a canoe, so if, if, if the Sugarcoffee Bridge breaks, 
God forbid, then or travel to... Yes, so in the past, when you are going to the, uh, my hometown, you use Dabala. And then you continue to then. So, Bernard, where is your hometown? No, that's Georgia. That's okay, so you are Georgia. Yes, so, further up there. Yes, we are a bit far. <laughs> we are, we are, yeah, yeah, <laughs> we are not in the winter. You're not in the league. No, no, we are, not, we, we are a bit up, up the north. But I just wanted you to look at the, the, the. So, this is Adan East. All right? So, this is Keji. So, you see how the water opens up in the estuary. Mm -hmm. So, the Adan and Keta together host this estuary. And then Sky then continues all of this to. Yeah. So, and a lot of these communities have water bodies and islands. So, mm -hmm. Dabala is next to a water body. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know what they call this this place. Is it Adigli Kopo? Adigli Kopo. You know that place, right? Adigli Kopo. Yes. yes. So this is the Sokwe as well. Sokwe. I saw images of Sokwe where the water level has risen so much, mm -hmm. you know. And then, as I said, Tefle. In fact, I'm told that Rawlings's house, mm -hmm. the water has gone to that house, oh. that area. There's a lot of water oh. wow. next to the house. Oh. So. For those of you who see it as a, a tourist attraction. Exactly. Uh, let me just make a quick point. You know the, mm. the, the, the bridge that Bernard was talking about? In the early 90s, during or maybe towards the late 90s, when... You mean the Sugar Yeah, bridge. the Sugar Yeah, this bridge. bridge. When Jerry Rawlings was the president, I remember that there was a major problem with the bridge, which meant that it could not be used. It became a more trouble. What that meant was that a lot of commercial activity or activities were affected. Because the people go to Togo, they go to Benin, they go to Nigeria to buy goods, mm -hmm. the Volta region, and then move it mm. to Greater Accra. Or they come to Greater Accra, uh, buy things, and then move them to the Volta region, Togo, and then Benin, and then Nigeria, and, and on and on you go. And as I was explaining, the people do a lot of fishing. And if you go to the Denu market, one of the biggest things that happen there is the sale of fish, dry fish, bull fish, and all of these things. When the bridge had a problem, it was a major headache. Hmm. Cars couldn't move. And I remember that at the point, the president had to commission a pontoon, yeah. which came and, and which meant that not so many vehicles could, could be moved, moved across. Yeah. So it was a major, major headache, and it crippled you know, commercial activity in, in, in the Volta region. We do know that for a long time, we had closed the border with Togo because of COVID. That has crippled economic activity already. in the in the water already. region already. And we are just now exactly, and we are just recovering back. exactly. Mm -hmm. And then we have this water disaster on our hands. We pray, mm -hmm. we pray, and then also act to ensure that it doesn't get to a place or a state where communities are wiped out or that bridge, that bridge, because people have to run away to either Accra or they have to go to Togo or related communities. Mm -hmm. If it gets to a point where people cannot move across, it is a major, major problem. So let's stay on this for, for a bit. You know, sometimes when, when people understand how it affects them, mm -hmm. it becomes more real. And then we understand why we need to get involved. So you mentioned fish. Mm -hmm. And we have different kinds of fish. We've got the sea fish, mm -hmm. you know, where, okay, your tuna, your, if you're a fan of the barracuda, mm -hmm. all those big, big, big fish, mm -hmm. even the snappers, right? The ones that you use for komi and kina, mm -hmm. those ones. But then we have the river fish, and river fish play a huge part mm -hmm. in what we eat. Mm -hmm. So those of you like the abobitadi, mm -hmm. it's not going to be coming down here mm -hmm. for you to eat. Mm -hmm. Those of you who do a lot with herring, shito is a huge part of what we eat. Mm -hmm. You know, all these little things. You mentioned catfish, mm -hmm. sky. Mm -hmm. Yes, we have people now doing cats fishing in bigger cities in the urban areas. Accra is one. Mm -hmm. I've seen a few cats fishing, um, you know, farms in Kumasi and whatnot. But a lot of that comes from communities mm -hmm. like this. Mm -hmm. That will be affected if we are not careful. In fact, mm -hmm. it, it, it's, it's already affected yeah. because if we're looking at the people, they're not thinking about going to look for fish yeah, right. for themselves, let mm -hmm. alone for you mm -hmm. at this point. Mm -hmm. They're thinking about how they're surviving, what the next point, what the next step is for themselves. Mm -hmm. And that's the reality that we're dealing with. Uh, we mentioned sugar cane. Mm -hmm. Big, big, big commodity for us here. Exactly. And a lot of these communities are farming that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, so it's a really real problem, regardless of how you look at it, from a health perspective, from a perspective of, you know, just shelter. Mm -hmm. There's that. 
there's an agric perspective and ultimately an economic, social economic perspective as well. It's a huge problem for us as a nation. Just, just to plug in, you, you remember that a couple of months ago when the Niger crisis happened, yes. we could not evacuate uh, onion mm. from <laughs> Niger, arguably the mm. biggest producer in Africa mm. of, of, of onion, and we depend on them a lot. Yeah. Although we produce a lot of shallot and onion in Southern Volta, uh, we also depend a lot on Niger. Now, imagine, when that happened, the cost of onion went up through the roof. Yeah, quadruple. Exactly. People, you know. They're doing 40 cities for about exactly. 10 pieces or less. Uh -huh. So imagine that these shallot farms and the tomato farms and then also the onion farms are wiped away yeah. just like that. How much would you buy onion for, mm -hmm. shallot yeah. for in the market? Yeah. So that's how serious yeah. it is. Now, also talk about tilapia. Now, I'm just looking at uh, data on Statista, which is one of the most reliable, you know, uh, platforms for, you know, verifying data on how much countries are producing and all of that. We're told that the value of tilapia produced in Ghana from 2013 to 20, uh, 2018 in millions of CDs is around 947 million Ghanaian CDs, which is roughly 154 million US dollars. That's how much, you know, hmm. tilapia we produce in Ghana. And the bulk of that happens around the North Tong, Central Tong, these communities. Yeah, because it is South a rare fish. Exactly. Yeah. And we have been told, speaking to uh, Honorable Okuje Toa Blackwa today, almost all the cages, the fish ponds that grow tilapia, catfish, and these other you know, varieties for us, they have been wiped away. What it means is that immediately, the tilapia economy has taken a devastating hit, mm. right? Then you also have catfish, which is a major staple for many people today. They eat it for recreational purposes. They eat it as a staple on their, food, their, their, their table and all of that. That is also taking a major hit as a result. Now, we know that COVID has already created problems for supply chain uh, you know, management around the world and moving goods from one end of the world to another has become a major issue. Mm -hmm. Now, if we are taking a hit locally, imagine what will happen if we do not have in enough in the country. Mm -hmm. What it means is you cannot have tilapia in the evening as you would want or in the <laughs> afternoon as you want or catfish as you would want or bovilolo or these mm -hmm. other options, uh, you know, abobi, which yeah. you spoke about. All of these, and again, if you go to the Adan areas, they produce what is known as Togo. Togo is, uh, you have medium tilapia, which they do not add, uh, what do you call it, salt to. They just dry it. People eat it a lot. And then you also have Akpatogi, which we call Momo. Momo. Is it Momo? This guy that. Uh -huh. Akpatogi. Akpatogi. Yeah. yeah. Akpatogi. So if you eat it, eat it here. Because if you die, you leave, you can't eat it. Uh -huh. Now, if people cannot produce that one, because when you collect it, when you harvest the fish, you dry it after putting salt and all that things into it. Sometimes they bury it to produce uh, you know, those, th those things for which, which we eat a lot. If those areas too are, are submerged, we have a major food crisis. And Kobe. Uh -huh, Kobe, yes. I mean, we're yeah. talking about tilapia. Uh -huh. Yes, that is. Yeah, that's where you talk about tilapia. Right. People think about so great tilapia. I was tilapia. witness to um, devastation to yeah. fish farms mm -hmm. in one of the communities. Um, we even showed um, drawn images of it. Um, mm. Kokonte Kwezi. They are just a few. Kokonte. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they produce just, a lot of kokonte. They are just a few <laughs> kilometers away from the dam itself, mm -hmm. so they are just downstream. And we're told that someone, one of the farmers, told that he had lost about 120,000 fingerlings wow. in wow. his in his pond. So one pond, uh, one cage is, um, contains 12,000 uh, fingerlings. fingerlings, and he had about 10 of them, hmm. and all of them, wow. yeah. And he had lost everything. Um, we, we saw investors um, who come to these communities to mm -hmm. partner with the locals mm -hmm. and to build these fish ponds. They had come to, they were just all just counting their losses. So, mm -hmm. so just, just to buttress your point that the tilapia wow. 
economy mm -hmm. is taking a nosedive. Mm -hmm. And wow. I mean, if you're looking to eat tilapia from now to the near future, That's it will cool. be very difficult to get tilapia. Mm -hmm. And they have to, you know, sell the the non-matured ones, mm -hmm. the yeah. very small, 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 small tilapia, ones. just to um, cut down on some mm -hmm. of these costs mm -hmm. because everything they had in these fish ponds, mm -hmm. they had been cool. wiped away from by, by, by the floods. Mm -hmm. Wow. I mean, that would, I think Bernard should be able to address this. You know, when I was speaking to Samuel Okujitu Ablakwa, I asked a question which I thought was too early, but which needed to be asked. Recovery. Mm. We do know what happened in the aftermath, or the immediate aftermath, and then the medium to long term aftermath of the Hurricane Katrina in Louisiana. You, you yeah. must have been there at the time that these things happened. And how the economy of the areas affected got stand crippled. Stand. Now, Bernard, mm -hmm. we are talking about farms. Mm -hmm. We're talking about tilapia. Yeah. We're talking about people who set up industries in these parts. Mm -hmm. We're talking about uh, what do you call it, sugarcane farms. We're talking mm -hmm. about all of these things. Mm -hmm. We don't know how long this thing will go. Mm -hmm. But in terms of the impact on economic activity and the economy of the affected areas, mm -hmm. what is likely to be wow. the, the danger we yeah. face? Especially as we do know, COVID came to create a problem. Yeah. Russia and Ukraine, as been yeah. mentioned. Uh, Israel, Israel uh -huh. Gaza, Gaza is, also is, also, uh -huh, is also there. We are just about recovering. And then also, people lost so much money to the debt exchange program. And now we have a major national disaster on our hands. You know, there's a lot of Ghanaians who already suffer from multidimensional poverty. Mm -hmm. And if you look at the areas you are referring to, um, poverty is endemic in agricultural areas. Mm -hmm. so a lot of our farmers are smallholder farmers. Our fisher folk are very poor. Places in central region and Volta region have a lot of poor people. So what I can immediately say, not even talking about the economy in terms of export revenue. We're just talking about livelihoods. livelihoods yeah. You're going to have... I listened to uh, a gentleman, Fred, interviewed this morning from um, um, one of the towns, and he said he doesn't have work to do. He doesn't know how he's going to survive for the next two or three weeks. Mm -hmm. So there's going to be a deepening of poverty. Already, the World Bank did a simulation of the macroeconomic situation leading to, like, end of 2022, and estimated that about 800,000 people, based on that simulation, had been rendered poor just by inflation. All right. So we are not talking about exchange rate issues. I've not even brought in these lot. So the point is that there's going to be a lot of suffering, mm -hmm. which the, the relief effort has to also address. Mm -hmm. All right. So as I said, first you salvage, you stop the rot, and then you build from there. Mm -hmm. I'm sure when the water recedes, people will try and build houses again. I think that in the long term, just like people were resettled in the communities I showed you in the earlier map, mm -hmm. you will need a resettlement program. Because if I live in... Uh, what do you call it, uh, North Town, the town that has 70% of it covered. Mm -hmm. There's no way my house will ever be the same again. And even if my house is recovered, I don't want to sleep there again because That's I don't know if it will have such a problem yeah. again. Mm -hmm. So there's a need for a more long-term resettlement plan, mm -hmm. which I think places like central region or drier areas have to be... And you know, the, the funny thing is that when you go across Ghana, if you go to fishing communities all the way from Elubo, down, you find a lot of Ewe communities. People move. They already are aware. Mm -hmm. So they trade their fishing skills all across. So you go to communities in the central region, you see an Ewe community. You go to places in the greater Accra region, you see Ewe communities as well. So those are some of the issues that uh, we are going to confront. So there's going to be a lot of multidimensional poverty. Mm -hmm. People are going to have a deepening of their financial challenges mm -hmm. and all of that. I'm told Fred Duho is, is back in town. So we'll yes. be talking to him shortly. Yes, we will. <laughs> He's very, been a man on the shortly. meet. Very <laughs> shortly. In the meantime, yes. we do have a flyer on the screen. Yeah. Yeah. It's our relief support campaign for yeah. affected residents of the Kosombo Dance Village mm -hmm. in the Laura Volta. Mm -hmm. uh, look, we've, we've said so much. If you haven't understood the devastation that's staring us in the face at this point, mm -hmm. then I don't know what else will let you see it. Mm -hmm. But even if you don't see it, you support yeah. because we need that support. I wanted to show you the Adam map to complete the picture. So Okay, so Brent, we'll, we'll, yes. yeah, I just want to ramp you since we have the fire on the screen already. Yes. So we need sachet water, bottled yes. water. Yes. We need canned or bagged food, mattresses, blankets, 
toiletries and detergent, medical supplies. The Momo number, if you want to send us cash, is 0550-900-006. 0550-900-006. The name on the account is Omni Media, and you use the reference flood support, flood support. And indeed, if you have questions, uh, you want to follow up, you're not sure about something, but you want to help, 0205-973-973. 0205-973-973. Now, Bernard has some maps that he no, wants to No, I just to wanted to through, point out that, you know, you know, we are doing this so people know that we are not focused on just one or two places. So as I said, Esojaman, yeah. Eastern Region, yeah. Shai Osudoku, Great Accra, North Tongue, Volta region, Central Town, Volta region, mm. South Town, Volta region. There's also Adan East. Mm. That's now, greater Accra. Fred had done Azizania and mm. other areas when the tidal wave issue occurred. So, mm. South Town, uh, East Ada, and Keta meet at the confluence of the Volta and the sea, mm. the, 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 the river, the, the Volta River and the sea. Mm -hmm. So, what I'm saying is that. The devastation has started from Isfujaman. It has hit North Town. If more water is spilled, based on the little geography I know, Ada will also suffer. Yeah. That's what I'm saying. So well, it has reached Kotsuga Kofen now. If we don't do anything about it, people in the places I've just put on this map, so you notice Ada for and Nazizanya are at the south, yes. they will also suffer. As I said, they are facing pressure from the sea at the bottom. Mm. And from and the river up the river there. At the top. So it's just to let you know that it's not just a Volta region issue. So when we say Volta, we are talking about yeah. the river. Yes, I mean, that's lower Volta. Yes. That's so, the so, river. so what we are saying yeah. is that the lower Volta Esojaman river. is Eastern region. Mm -hmm. Yilo and Manya are Eastern region. Mm -hmm. Shai Osudoku and Adan is the Greater Accra region. Mm -hmm. Then you have uh, the Three Tones mm -hmm. and then Keta and Ketu. Mm -hmm. So that's about 10 constituencies. Mm -hmm. With over three million people, it's 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 very serious. Look, it's very serious, and I'd like to welcome Fred Duho. He has been one of the the stalwarts, <laughs> <laughs> you know, in these areas that we're talking about um, right from the beginning. You were there. You brought us many of the initial reports that we saw, that we listened to. I'd like to start by just taking you know, stock of what you're going through, what you're feeling at the moment, because I can imagine the kind of trauma, I said this to Charles as well earlier, kind of trauma that you're dealing with. Um, I know that you also may have relatives in some of these areas. How does it make you feel having to put aside the work, you know, um, and then commiserate with them, but then also put the feelings of family and love aside and then do the work and bring us the story. So what's that been like for you? Well, on a personal note, I will say it comes with the job. <laughs> 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 so um, the devastation on my part will be, I mean, less felt compared to those who are in it mm -hmm. currently. Mm -hmm. uh, my, this job determines that you go to this kind of, uh, I mean, go as far as the communities to bring out the stories. We are only telling their stories. Personally, you come across certain things that will strike you at a point in time, and you feel like, to what extent uh, would these people uh, continue to suffer or grapple with these issues? Uh, like, for instance, today when I met a certain gentleman who is physically challenged, mm. Mm. and you can imagine what he went through when the water came into his room, mm. and a mother who delivered two days and the water just oh. entered her room. She had to now bear with the pain mm -hmm. and pack or salvage some of her belongings That's to exactly. save ground. So today, uh, luckily enough, I understand or I witnessed where there's a temporal clinic set up at one of the secondary schools to cater for their health needs. And that is where they went. And you, start, you see that most of them are beginning to request for medical attention. And one very good thing that has been done so far is to the effect that mental health coordinator is also there oh, and from to time to that. time engaging with them, glad encouraging them, giving them hope yeah, that these that's things that's are part of nature. And from her interaction with the people, she made known that uh, the people are uh, depressed mm -hmm. because from time to time they are just basically talking about my building, mm -hmm. my yeah. building, mm -hmm. my properties are in the building. Mm -hmm. 
and they are unable to salvage anything. Some of them just left basically with what they are wearing. Mm. Yeah. And that should tell you that indeed these people need some mm. urgent help. So did the water come in the night? Was it sudden? How did they, was it that they saw the water come and they left or did they describe how it happened to you? Let me take it from the eastern region part where the fisher folks told us that there was this level of uh, community engagement that took place. They admitted that uh, VRA came to their community, but it was too late. Mm -hmm. VRA came and then the following night, the water, the water started, started coming. Started today. coming. So I want to believe that even though there is that level of engagement, the timing was quite too close and the water just started gushing into their uh, premises. They had no choice than either flee uh, pack the very things they can salvage at the moment and then uh, make their way out of that danger else uh, it would have been trouble for them i must commend the police the navy um NADMO. i mean we've seen them on the ground mm -hmm. the, the ghana national fire service all of them they are there in their with their tankers making sure that they are giving them i mean water that is good for consumption mm -hmm. Uh, don't forget, now the water has been declared a bit, uh, I mean, compromised, right. that you can't really drink for, for your health uh, to be, a, you should be able to depend on the sachet water for now. And looking at the population we are talking about now, yeah. that depends on this water river, yeah. that should tell you that in, in, a lot more needs to be done. By the time we're living there, uh, standard water actually, they also came into the community oh, with some brilliant. 800 bags uh, with, with a truck trying to help with, with with this need so generally it's devastating and uh, i was quite glad when i i heard on radio this morning that uh, management has initiated the move to mobilize resources coordinate resources to be able to go and support these people a lot more of the state agencies are doing their part the member of parliament for the area is also doing his bit but I mean, the numbers, they are overwhelmed, let me put it that way, uh, from, from the population that has been displaced so far. Mm. All right, thank you, Fred. I mean, we will be wrapping up with this session very shortly. I hope that for those of you who have been watching us uh, from wherever you are in the country or in the world, you have been touched, you have been informed, and you now understand why it is important for us to rally together in this time to make sure that people in these districts, in these communities, in these regions of Ghana are helped and they, they need our support. So once again, we're running a relief support campaign here at City FM, City TV. Items that we need, Fred just, I mean, put it very perfectly that the water has been compromised. Mm. So people need clean water to drink, to bath, to brush their teeth to make food for their children, mm. you know. Don't forget, there are a lot of young babies who may be there who cannot even eat solids yet. Mm. So water is important. Mm. We need food, canned or bagged food, mattresses, blankets, toiletries and detergent. We mm -hmm. need medical supplies because, again, we are staring a potential health crisis in the face. And you can use the Momo number 550 um, the name on the account is Omni Media, and you use the reference flood support, flood support. And again, if you don't know what to do or you have something else in mind that you think can help, call the number 0205-973-973. It's the hotline here at City FM and City TV, 0205-973-973. And if you're watching us from beyond the shores of Ghana, your help would be welcome as well. So you can call the same number. We'll communicate with you. The team who will answer the phone lines will speak to you. Just make sure that you call this same number, but drop the first zero and prefix the number with the country code plus 233. Once again, very important. We need water, sachet or bottled. We need food, canned or bagged. We need mattresses. We need blankets, toiletries and detergent. And then we need medical supplies and anything that you think may help, you can call the hotline. We'll let you know um, based on our consultation with VRA, NADMO, um, medical officers who are on the ground, anybody who understands the situation will let you know whether it's needed or not before you bring it in. All right, so I've been in the studio. Bernard Avler, thank you very yeah. much for joining us. Fred Duho just yeah. came through as Please well. Please announce yeah. that I'll, yes. I'll be on the point of view tonight yes, live and definitely. I'll hopefully have Fred on. 
uh, we have a few people who will be joining us uh, as well. We, we are given this what we call a 360 coverage yeah. because I think all the work, the, the roles of media is for people to see the reality. Absolutely. So they would, they would have another chunk on CNR tonight at 8 p.m. Some of the work Fred and Sanda are doing will show and I'll have them on, on the point of view as well to give us more insights. And I speak to some more people from the field and some experts as well. Definitely. So if you were watching this and you want to, you don't know how to tell, you know, sometimes you've watched something, but you don't know how to tell people what you've seen or what you've heard. Mm -hmm. Make sure that they catch CNR, the City Newsroom at 8 p.m. right here on City TV. Watch the point of view at 9 p.m. again here on City TV. So I have been here with Bernard Avle. He's the host of the City Breakfast Show and the point of view on City TV. Um, he's been giving us interactions. I mean, since this morning, he's really spoken to the VRA, to NADMO, seen and heard a lot of the things behind the scenes that we've brought to you this afternoon. Earlier, we had Charles Owusu-Kumi. He's with the City News Desk. He's also been in the field. He told us what he's seen, saw. We had Richard Della Sky also on the City Breakfast Show on 97.3 City FM and with the City News Desk as well, also giving us his perspectives and his knowledge of all the places, all the geography <laughs> that's been affected. And Fred Duho, he's been there from the beginning on the ground with many others who are still out there, members of our team who are bringing us the stories and working to keep you informed. 